Hello, hello. How's everybody doing today? Happy Thursday. Um, we are back. Um, I'm, I'm still rather torn personally about this, but uh, again, I, I, I love you guys. I love Geo. I uh, do want to support them, um, but uh, I'll just be honest here. I don't think the, the amount of impact that I can have as one person on the Dearborn campus when this is really very, very Ann Arbor focused um, is, is going to be worth just canceling another class on you guys. So um, uh, they, they did get an offer from the administration, rejected it. They're still on strike. Um, but, you know, I'll, I don't know. I, I want to keep class going if I can help it. If, um, if things change and they need more support from more faculty members, then uh, we'll see how things go. But hopefully this will end soon. Uh, the admin's working with them, possibly. Uh, again, I'm not too involved in it here at all, just uh, tangentially. So it's happening. Uh, I'm feeling a little bad, but um, I, I do want to keep things moving for you guys as well. So we do have a bunch of other stuff going on. Um, if we don't get through all of Chapter 2 today, that's all right. Uh, we've got time. We can bump it a little bit. Um, working with variables and expressions here in Python. We've got our first lab session scheduled for Monday the 14th, right? The labs I didn't put on here, these are just the lecture dates. Um, that'll be an in-person lab if you're comfortable with coming. Um, again, it's a little bit silly um, for us to be meeting in person at this point because we are not going to be with, with getting within six feet of each other, so I can't even like come up to your computer and look at your code and help you with something. Um, so we're going to use screen sharing tools while we sit in a room far apart from each other. Um, maybe that's a little bit easier for some conversation or, or what have you, so we'll, uh, we'll we'll see how well it works and if, uh, if if there's not value in it then maybe we'll try and move those remote as well. Uh, but we'll, we'll play that uh, by year and see how it goes. Um, I'm definitely open to your guys' feedback. Um, and then we'll do our first lab. Uh, that's practice working with some of these things. We'll get you to submit something to your private GitHub repository. Um, someone had mentioned, I, I forgot I sent out a survey and then I asked you to email me. So either way, whether you emailed me or you filled out the survey and I got your GitHub username, I created a private GitHub repository for you. And again, uh, we're using the GitHub tool here. They're the hosting provider of Git source control services. Um, it's free for us, which is fantastic. Uh, so I, I'm fond of it here. Let me make sure I'm in the right class here now. Fall 2020. Awesome. And this is how we're going to be communicating with code, right? It's designed for collaboration. It's fantastic. So once you've got your repository cloned, and uh, we can walk through this in lab or earlier if you want, just shoot me a note. Uh, we can chat sometime and do some screen sharing if you need it to set up locally on your computer. Uh, we'll have just a fancy folder, right? So your two best buttons here are this repository menu. You can go to view on GitHub and show in Explorer. So view on GitHub is going to check the website and see if we can see your code online. Right, so if you can see it online on github.com, I'll be able to see it online in github.com. And that's a good thing. If you want me to grade your code, then I need to be able to see it online. So right in here, you can find the py file, right? And these are just text files, right? Python is just text, and we can see what's in here. It's fantastic. And this, the URL, is what you can give me when you submit your assignments in Canvas. Right, so for the first project, I'll ask you to submit the link to your Python code. That's all you have to give me is the URL here. It's fantastic. All right, and then uh, the other piece we're going to need is to show in Explorer so we know where to put our projects. You don't necessarily have to start your projects here. You can drag and drop them in after the fact, uh, but life is just much easier if we start our projects here. So I'm going to fire up PyCharm, and we're going to start up a new project for today where we can work through some examples and we'll have a lot of fun. Come on, PyCharm. Let's go. I think I'm due for an update too. I forgot I was supposed to update that. That's okay. Um, let's see, we've got 10 people subscribed to the book. That's pretty good. I think 15 people are in the class last time I checked. Um, so we're getting there. Um, you, you do get 10% of your grade overall for doing the Zybook exercises and readings. There's like participation reports I can run. I'm not going to run them every week because honestly, it's just a, it's not worth my time to do that. 
Um, and if you guys aren't doing it in time, right, that's that's going to be on you. So, and it will show when I grade your assignments um, if you've not been keeping up with the reading. And we also have the quizzes. Um, so the quizzes are over the material on the textbook. So again, just because I didn't mention it doesn't mean it might not be on the quiz. So the quizzes are another incentive for you to keep up with the reading. And those ones I do every week and they have due dates because you've got to keep up with that point. So you're getting almost double points for, for keeping up and doing these quizzes. They're open book, open notes, open internet. Uh, they're not difficult. The, just the idea is here, here's your chance to answer some questions about the stuff you read and I, I'll get a feel for whether or not you're understanding it. Um, so most people do very well in the quizzes. I do drop the lowest quiz because just everybody has a bad day or misses one or something. Uh, so I will will drop your lowest. That should all be automatic in Canvas if I did things right. Um, I'm usually pretty decent with Canvas. So if it doesn't look like it's working, let me know. Um, I'll, I'll definitely fix that up for you. But in PyCharm, we're going to start up a new project. And once you start it, a project in a location, it usually remembers that location for you. So we shouldn't have to go find this path every time where we say show an explorer and go click in here in the breadcrumb trail and copy that. Uh, it's control C for copy by the way if you're not familiar with that. Here we go. So perfect. So it already has that path for me. I could just paste it in too if I wanted. Uh, this one I can't zoom. I'm sorry it's a little bit tiny here. Uh, but then you want to put another slash and then the name of this project. So for, for us this is just going to be September 10th. Uh, and then if you want to you can check this interpreter. It should use the existing one if that's what you told it to do. Perfect. Uh, I want to use my virtual environment. It shouldn't really matter much. Just the big thing here is you don't want to make a new environment every time. Because that's just going to be it's sitting, spinning, copying a bunch of files around when you don't really need them. So just use an existing one, virtual or not, should be okay. Um, it's, we're not going to do anything major anyway. So, And we'll make our project. And then in this case, I want the current project to close. So I'm going to say this window. You could do new windows if you want multiple instances of PyCharm up. You can, you can copy paste between things perfectly fine. And right off the bat, when I come to my GitHub client, I'm going to see a bunch of files changed. Should get, huh? All right, not too many files here. Thought I would get a couple more than that, but that's all right. Oh, is it still loading? Maybe it's still loading a little bit. There they are. All right, I just had to take it a second. Now these are all these XML files, IML, whatever. Just These are all fine. Well and good. You can leave them as they are. All right? Don't if they change, they change. Um, just leave them alone. And so this is the empty project shell. And remember, commits are free. You make commits early and often. They're once we've committed and pushed to GitHub.com. It's really hard to lose your code. If you just commit and forget to push, GitHub.com will never know about it. So do make sure it's always a commit and push for our processes, at least. Um, other organizations have rules about how they do their code control, um, and source, co source control management and stuff like that, but um, we're just going to commit and push every time because you each have your own repository. You're not going to break anything by pushing. Now what I can do in my empty project is I'm going to right click and say I want to add a new item. New, and I'm going to go to Python file. You could do file as well, but if you do Python file it knows it's a Python file. It just makes life a little easier. And we'll call this September 10th. And this, it knows we're using GitHub. It's fine if you add or don't, doesn't matter again. I'm just going to say don't ask me again. Um, and I can zoom in, enhance, enhance. And notice it automatically added the PY extension here. So when I come back to my GitHub client, I have a file. It's a .py file. They don't have to end with .py, but that's just the convention, so we know they're Python files. And it makes Windows at least happy and knows how to open them. Right, but it's empty. There's no text inside of it. So again, we could do our print hello world, and now I should get some file contents. Right, hello world. So again, commits are free. We might as well make one. Hello world. We'll commit and push. Then I'm going to check to see if I can see this code on GitHub.com. So I'm going to just go back up to my main repository link. That's the root folder. I'll see. Oh, hey, there's a September 10th folder here. Let me just refresh. One more time. There we go. Changed 15 seconds ago. Now I have my hello world commit. I go to the 10th and I can see September 10th.py and here's the one line. Again, not super exciting, just hello world at this point, uh, but we can we can check it out. All right, so when we played a little bit last week with um, that temperature conversion calculator, 
right? we were using variables. And the idea is that if the only thing my code ever does is like print stuff, it's not a very interesting command. So what we need is a way to have Python store information that we can get at later. And we did that with variables. So we said like the temp in f was something and then we would convert those sort of things. So temp in f is a variable name here. And we get to pick our variable names. There are programmer assigned. Python could care less what we call them, essentially. I mean, as long as we follow the rules on using the right characters. You can have letters, you can have numbers, you can have underscores. Don't throw special characters in there is, is typically the rule. Um, and all I'm always going to say, it's always better to be a longer name because the code here is for people. People care about what the Python code says. The computer doesn't care if it's F. But oops, uh, when I come back and I look at F, I'm not going to remember what that is. Again, right, the, the code is for people to look at and understand and, and follow. So temp and F is much better. Uh, we can do some other interesting stuff. Hey, Uncle Bill, thanks for hanging out. Where uh, let's let's do some like a little store calculator, right? So we'll have um, you know the total. Um, we'll have an order total, and we're going to start it off at zero. So until you've ordered something, it costs zero dollars. Right? You haven't spent any money at the store yet. But now I have a place that I can be storing that value as it changes. So as you order items, I can go and I can change this value here. And Python does a bunch of cool things. If you actually read in chapter two behind the scenes, um, this is considered an object. So any variable we have is really an object. It stores a value. This is the value that it's storing. Right? Via the, this is not an equal sign, it's the assignment operator. Right? So we're assigning the thing on the right, storing it here by name. So this is the um, this is the object. Um, objects also have types. Um, behind the scenes, computers are pretty good at following um, what a given type is. Um, yeah, if you're having trouble opening a new project, um, I, I can do some screen sharing after the fact and get you going on that. Um, so the type of object being stored here, right, is a numeric value as we're storing numbers. So um, we, we'll call these ones integers because they're whole numbers. There's a difference between numbers that are whole numbers, integers, and numbers that have decimal places um, or floating point numbers, we might call them at that point. Um, so you can get information out by just using the name now. So if I wanted to print the value of my order total, I just say print order total and I use the variable name. And behind the scenes, Python's going to go say, oh, this is a just an object here. Go go get the value of that object, and it's going to go print it, which is really nice. So I can get zero. Right now, if I right click and run, or go up to the run menu and hit run, right now, always tons of ways to do it. And see down here, if I enhance a little bit, we get hello world, and then zero. And we might want to say something a little bit nicer, like your order total is, and then maybe a, a dollar sign. And now, what's really cool with um, this print command, you can just drop some commas in here and just keep adding stuff to that. So if I want to add more values, right, I just keep comma separating and just keep adding more values. Um, the only downside to that is it's going to put a space in between. So what I had was the dollar sign. It will put a space in between there for me. Not too big of a deal. There's ways to get around it, but for now that's, that's perfectly fine. All right. Now let's say we wanted to change the order total. Let's say I ordered something. So we're going to say, hey, print... You, and again, you can use single quotes or double quotes. Python doesn't care. Um, typically, I just tell people to be consistent. Um, which, whichever you prefer is fine. It's, it's good with either, but I'll, I'll do both just so that you see both in there and know you can do both. Um, you bought a coffee. I don't know. Uh, sure. Or for a dollar. For one dollar. Okay. So we're telling them that, but now what we're going to do is we're going to change the value of order total. So I'm going to change the value that it's storing here. I'm going to say order total equals or gets assigned a new value. And now what I could do is I could just say one because I know right it was a one dollar item. But it's going to get us into a, a bad habit later because what I really want to be doing is adding a dollar to the current total. So to do that, I just grab order total again and I'll say order total plus one dollar. Right? And we can do arithmetic. The computer is decent at arithmetic. So whatever order total used to be. We're going to add one to it, 
And then that new value, we're going to calculate that. This will get evaluated and we'll assign it right back on top of order total. So that we get the thing on the right happens, and then it assigns to the thing on the left. So we can do that. And some people are, are fans of shortcuts. Um, so I'll show you in a second. Let's go buy something else. I will just do the dollar sign. Um, what else do you guys want to buy at the store? Should we get more coffee? I mean, we can't have enough coffee. Pretty sure that's a rule. Oh, how about how about an, an espresso? An espresso for some reason is, you know, let's say a dollar fifty. Okay, so I can take my order total. Oh, a donut and pizza. Okay, we'll get to those in just a minute. Thanks, guys. Um, let's do the espresso for dollar fifty. Now I'm going to take my order total, and and again, the, the reason long variable names are fine, like it's not more work to type them. You see, as I'm typing, PyCharm is suggesting, hey, do you mean this thing? Do you mean this value? And uh, you got a couple options. Right? You can either go up and down arrow if you want, and it's going to like, you see how it kind of highlights each one. Uh, you can go find the one you want, or you just keep typing more letters. As soon as you get to the one you want, if you hit tab, it will finish that or complete it for you. So it's uh, IntelliSense, we call it in Visual Studio, code completion, I think I've seen other places, I forget what other people call it here, type ahead, I don't know, it's probably the wrong term for it, but that's what I call it sometimes. So if you have a long variable name, it's not any more work to type it because you're probably not typing the whole variable name anyway. Right? Let the computer do the work for you. You, you want to be a efficiently lazy programmer. Uh, yeah, this uh, PyCharm is great. Um, it's a nice IDE here. Uh, you know, I use, I use different IDEs for different languages. Um, just sort of depends, and and some of it um, depends on the campus as well. Yeah, yeah. But being able to have the language or your development environment suggest things for you is fantastic because no one's going to memorize everything. Right? No one has the brain power to keep everything in their head for the things they're going to know. And when you go out and work in the real world, no one's going to expect you to do that from memory because. That would just be silly for them to say, don't use the resources. Don't use your online tools. Don't use books, whatever you want to use. Just do it all off the top of your head, which is terrible. Ah, uh, yeah, IntelliSense is probably a, is that trademarked at this point. <laughs> um, definitely, I, I came from the Visual Studio world, so that's that's my what I'm familiar with. All right, but a shortcut here, because it, you know I'm lazy and I don't have to type order total twice or OR tab twice, what I can do is this assignment operator, we've got some additional shortcuts. This is a plus equals 1.5. This is a combined assignment operator. So if we're just changing a value of a variable, right, the good folks who write Python for us are also lazy developers and said, I don't have to type it twice, I'll give you a shortcut. Boom, so plus equals. Now, the only thing you have to be careful for um, is you don't want to say equals plus. And thankfully, it, it like, oh wait, what? It's and that's only just a warning. It's not even an error. So this will run here, and then let's um, print out your order total again here. So you bought the coffee. Your order total is that we bought. I'm just copy pasting here because again, I'm lazy. Uh, Control C for copy is your best friend. Um, some people like the right click, but that takes a little longer because those menus aren't the fastest thing. So let's see what happens if I do equals plus. We'll run this guy. Right. My order total is zero. Right. I bought a coffee. Order total is a dollar. Bought an espresso. A dollar fifty. It should have been two fifty. But what happened here is what Python is thinking is, oh, you want to assign it the value of positive one point five. Right. It's this positive one point five is perfectly legal. You know, by default we know it's positive because we didn't add a negative. But if we flip these around, we get really bad results. So just be careful. If you like the shortcuts, you want plus equals. And it's not going to tell you you did the wrong thing. So there we go. And now we get 250 for our order total. All right. So either either way, you want to do it. Perfectly fine with me. I don't really care. Uh, I, I think I told you before. As long as your code works, you and I are fine. All right. I'm going to grade you according to a rubric, and the rubric is going to say it does this. It does this. It accomplishes this goal. That sort of thing. Um, You'll probably, for your first project, I'll probably throw in a point or two just because there's not very many points to give because you're not going to do a whole lot of complex things for your first project um, for using good variable names. And that's just your incentive to use good ones. Um, again, Python doesn't care if you call this O instead of order total, but I care because I have to read your code. 
right? And the, the person reading your code and grading it should be able to understand what it's doing. Um, the other thing people like to do, um, and, and again, I'm advocating strongly against this, is they'll say, as a comment, remember you can drop in a pound sign. This is not a hashtag. I am old enough to remember that this was a pound sign. Pound sign for a comment, order total, and then they'll just call it O. If you have to put a comment in to tell me what your variable is, you've done too much work, right? All you had to do was name your variable order total, and then you just skip the comment. Right? The comment is adding no value there at all. And then everywhere else you just use the letter O, I'm going to be confused because by the time I've read 50 lines of code, I'm going to forget. Um, I have to look and see um, why it's not running. So it probably has to do with your Python environment. Um, I, I initially forgot to add the step to remind you guys to download Python in the, the links that I gave you in the syllabus. I think I did go and update that uh, back in the syllabus here with the links. Yep, so Python 3x something or other. Do this one first and then PyCharm. If you do it after, it should still work. PyCharm is relatively intelligent and should be able to find where it is. If it's still not finding it, uh, we just need to give it a little kick and say, hey, go add a Python environment here. It's a couple more clicks in PyCharm. Um, usually it's confusing to a lot of people, but you can I can show you where to change it later. Um, it's probably easier over a screen sharing session or making like a separate video for it or something. Um, so we're just changing the value of this, this variable all the time. Um, this particular variable here, notice we started off at zero as a whole number. Um, so there's actually a really cool um, thing. You can say type and you give it something. It's, Python will tell you what type it is. So and I'm just going to put this in strings, um, order total type, and just comma separate, right? And print is happy to take more than one thing and it will print it out for us. So let's take a look at the type of order total here. Order total type, class int. This looks like a bunch of gibberish here, but int is short for integer. Uh, it's technically a class because Python uses classes for all sorts of things. We'll get more into classes later on when we get um, into that chapter. For now, just shake your head and nod. Yeah, okay, it's a class. Um, we'll, we'll understand more what that means later. So when I'm storing just a zero, it is in int. I'm adding a dollar to it, and it's, we'll see what it is. When I add a dollar fifty, let's see what it is. Okay. Let's give it a shot and we'll see what happens here to our variable. All right, so we int, right? Now it's storing a dollar in int still. Storing a dollar fifty, it changed to float. Remember, I said float are numbers that have decimal places. Uh, the reason Python cares is that behind the scenes, things have to get stored differently. I think we talked real briefly about binary. You get binary bits that are either on or off. We put a bunch of bits together to make numbers. Does that ring a bell? I'm teaching like three different intro to coding classes, um, so honestly, I'm a, I'm a little confused sometimes myself. So please shout at me if I if I am acting like we've already covered something and we haven't. Um, thankfully, I just have the one Python class, so I hopefully we'll keep it relatively straight. Have you guys checked out Zybooks? I know like ten of you have subscribed. It looked like um, do do be sure to give me some feedback about it. Um, we so much or so far as a department have bought into it um, our sister class cis 150 uh, which is the computer science one class but we teach in c plus plus also uses zybooks and it's essentially the same thing but they do it in c plus plus and we do it in python um, so people seem to like it uh, I, I like that it's interactive uh, i think that's pretty interesting um, so let me know um, if, if i get enough people saying they hate it i would be happy, more than happy to look for another book or another option there for you. Um, and I was kind of a fan. It used to be relatively cheap. Um, yeah, we'll do um, one chapter a week except for this week here where we do two chapters because they're real short, except the exceptions and modules. So typically I'll, I'll lecture the entire chapter for the week. Um, and the lab schedule actually works out well because we'll have a lab after we've talked about the topic and then that'll be your chance to practice it where I can help you troubleshoot the code kind of time set aside for you to do the lab exercises um, so you get a lab exercise every week which gives you another 10% of your grade so like essentially keeping up with the reading and the practices is 30% of your grade there right and then bigger projects right that's the, the homework style projects uh, the goal for labs is that you can finish it in the hour 45 that we have um, set aside 
some people finish faster, some people don't take a little longer, that's okay. Uh, but labs aren't meant to be homework, if that makes sense. Right? We've got the dedicated class time for it, because we have weirdly three hours of lecture, or two and a half hours of lecture, and an hour 45 of lab, but it's a four credit class. I, I don't know how the math works behind the scenes for that. Um, because these two hour 15 lectures are almost like a three credit lecture, just slightly shy of that, and the lab time is almost two credits because it's an hour 40, well, whatever. Um, you guys probably don't actually care. Uh, but we've got the time for it. So the projects are made to be the homework, the stuff you do outside of class, um, the one midterm exam that we have. Um, again, I've got too many people for us to do it in lab. I haven't updated the syllabus yet, I apologize. Um, so we'll do it during the lab time. Like we'll, we'll say, hey, here's the time set aside to get this done. Um, I'll have that open for everybody to do um, so we won't have a lab for 1019. It'll be okay. Um, if, if you're missing practice with strings, we, we can pick that up um, after the fact. It won't be too big of a deal. We'll do our lab this Monday 1019, or the, the midterm 1019. Um, we'll just do it remotely because we can't fit 15 students plus me into the room. Our cap is 14. And then the one person who's not in the end, whatever, right? Um, so we'll, we'll just do this one remotely. And then the final project that we're going to start, um, I should be able to give it to you the week before Thanksgiving. After we've covered inheritance, we'll have enough to get the final project done. Um, recursion we talk about, but really we will um, come back next semester in 2001, and we cover recursion a lot more in depth. We spend much more time on it and do a whole project on recursion. So we're not going to use that in the final project um, there'll, there might be something I'm going to ask you to plot in that final project, uh, but we'll have plenty of time to talk about it, give you some examples. It, it's not going to be a super fancy plot or anything like that. Um, but plotting is my favorite part because we actually get something other than console input. Um, plotting actually looks like something, right? And we can see some graphs, which is really cool. Python, or the, the ggplot library is phenomenal, or pyplot, I'm sorry. pyplot library is phenomenal. Um, anything and everything you could ever imagine graphing can be done here in Python. Maybe not anything, but I mean, essentially we can do almost anything we want to, to show some data graphically, which is fantastic. It's such a great tool for that. Uh, but yeah, one, sorry, all that from just a one-line question. We do one chapter a week. Yes. <laughs> uh, next time I'll stick to a little shorter answer. I'm sorry. All right. So notice the type change, right, to float, because we needed to accommodate a number with a decimal place. So Python is kind of an interesting language, and if you haven't programmed in any other language, you're not going to appreciate it as much. And that's okay. Um, it's, you can just take it for granted, and it's great. Um, but what Python lets you do is you can change the type of data a variable stores anytime you want. So now I can, let's do the order total, and I'll say, hey, it equals uh, $5. Or 525. And notice it's in quotes as a string, right? So now when I print this out, oh, we'll take off, I'm sorry, I'll take out the dollar sign. But if I put it in quotes, right, that's a string value, not a numeric value anymore. So when I run my program, let me enhance that here, it's class str, that's short for string. A string is just a bunch of characters all put together. One or more characters is a string. Technically, even an empty string with no characters is still a string, uh, but Sure. Zero or more characters is a string. I'll be more precise. Now the problem is though, with a string, we can't do arithmetic. Right? If I wanted to take an order total and add another $1.50 now, right, and then let's see what we get here. Let's run this guy again. We get big red error. Oh no! A type error. Um, this essentially crashed our program. Um, and if you guys use programs ever, or apps on your phone, or, you know, anything ever, there's not very many things more frustrating than having your program crash. And I don't know why, maybe that's just our, our human um, nature that we get frustrated easily, but when your program crashes, you just like, and you just get mad about it. So later, we're going to learn ways to make sure our programs don't crash. For now, we just we don't have the capabilities to fix it. So if it crashes, it crashes, and we'll we'll deal with it later. Um, what we get here is a stack trace or a trace back, sure, um, and it's telling us, hey, at line 25 of this file here, line 25, boom, right here, and it even tells me what that line is, which is nice. Like, so I can't change it here, 
but I can go find it here in my code if I need to change something. It says type error can only concatenate str, not float, to str. And remember, str means string. So a string, you can't concatenate a string, or can only concatenate string to string. So you can do silly things in Python where you take one string and you add another string. Well, you're not adding, you're concatenating. And concatenating means take this string and this string, stick them together. Right? So I could have a fun little string like first name is Eric and last name Charneski. And full name I can say is first name, first name plus last name. And it's not plus. Like we're not doing addition here because you can't add strings. So what happens is this addition operator gets interpreted by Python to mean, oh, you want to concatenate, you want to stick them together. So now I can print full name, right? And let's give it a shot. Look at that, I get Eric Chernesky stuck together. Oh, there's no space there, right? When you stick strings together, when you concatenate, you don't get spaces. It does exactly what you tell it to do. Put one string here, the next string there, and stick them together. So the error we get here, right, is we can only concatenate strings to strings. So it knows this is a string, and it's trying to concatenate because we're using this addition operator here. It's trying to take this floating point value and concatenate it. And it gets really confused because you can take a string and a string and switch them together, but you can't take a string and a number because there's, the number won't stick, right? It's not a string, it doesn't fit. So we do need to be careful because you can change the type of a value here. We can do some crazy things in Python and hurt ourselves. We just need to be careful. It's super helpful that I can add 1.5 and it changes immediately to a floating point number. Right? It started off as an integer, remember? Because it was a whole, a whole number. Started as an int. I, let me add an int. It's still an int. As soon as I add a floating point number, it knows, oh, you need to be a float. You know, other languages will say are strongly typed, and you can't do that sort of thing. Once a value is an integer, it stays an integer. So. Python behind the scenes will let me change types, but it still knows what the type is. It's just going to automatically change it for me. So putting order total as a string here is a bad idea. Right? So don't 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 do that. Right? Don't mix and match your your strings and your integers. Okay? You should be in pretty good shape. Uh, the other thing, right? That um, operator assignment combined assignment operator here plus equals. I can add another string. Let's add uh, Eric Chinesky the Great. Right? Oh, sure. Well, we can take after the, some of the, was that the Scandinavian ancestors? I forget whoever they were. Or it should be Eric the Red, that's right. And now we get Eric Charneski the Great. Notice I added my own space here, because I didn't want the to be stuck next to Charneski. So the addition operator is still concatenating, even in a combined assignment operator. And it's taking the new value here, of what full name plus the great is and storing it back on top of full name. And just like when we did our numbers, we're taking the new value, taking what it used to be, adding this to it, and then assigning it back over here. So um, values can be mutable or immutable. So when we change numbers, we're changing the value that's stored in memory. And again, this is probably a little bit more advanced than we need. We get more into it next semester as well. Uh, but when you change a string like this, it actually, behind the scenes, is making a brand new string. So this, uh, what we'll call it, is, is an expensive operation or a little bit slower than some other sorts of operations. For our purposes, we don't really care too much. Um, but just kind of keep that in the back of your head. That that's sort of a slow thing. When, it, when the book talks about mutability. Um, let's see. More stuff there. Awesome. Uh, rules for identifiers. Um, great. Um, we can't use any reserved words. Um, Python will get very unhappy with us. And it is case sensitive. So order total versus order total here. Two different things. Now I get, thankfully, I get an unresolved reference error here. Just telling me, I don't know what this refers to. Remember, a, a variable is just a reference. You know, we're saying, hey, name this thing. Here's the name for it. Go store a value somewhere. So it's referencing the value that it's storing over there. So if I give it a name it hasn't seen before, it says, hey, unresolved reference. Has no idea what that is. So those are good. Um, the book goes through all sorts of style guidelines. That's fantastic. Um, again, I much prefer long variable names. I'll give you a hard time if you give me short ones. 
Um, aside from the first project, you, you'll probably get away with it because I'm not going to assign any points for it. Um, but I'll just give you a hard time when you give me bad variable names. Um, great. Floating point numbers, yep. Um, lots of good stuff. Um, it is possible to get a number that's too large because um, the, wow, the maximum floating point value is somewhere around 1.8 times 10 to the 308th. That's a really, really big number. Um, so, yeah, wow. So let, let's see, let's just play with it here. The book had some fun examples. So we're going to print, we'll say, uh, two to the power of, and let's just do a couple powers here, say like um, 100. And there's actually an operator here, which is fantastic. It's times times. So it's not two times, but two times times gives me two to the power of, so two to the power of 100 here. Let's see if we can do that one. And then we'll print, um, I'm just gonna copy paste and change those numbers, because that makes my life easier. Two to the 200. Right, and let's see, two to the 400. And let's see what we get here. Let's just see if we can get some big numbers. All right, wow, that's even off screen when I enhance. We're still okay, a two to the 400. I don't even know what this number is. That's just ridiculous. Sure, uh, but we didn't break it yet, so let's keep going. Let's say, I don't know what, two to the 800? Let's see if we can do that one. We're still okay. That still gave me a number. Holy crap. Okay, let's go bigger. Right? Go bigger, go home. How about two to the sixteen hundred? Right? Let's let's just be real crazy here and see what we get. Is that a number? Alright, still there. Wow. We are not too large. Oh, maybe I you know I know what the problem might be. Um, if we give it floating point numbers, that might be what we need to break it. My apologies. So what I get for not reading the book is clear. There we go, finally. So with a floating point number, it realizes it's too big. Hooray. And look at that, we even get as floating point values, we're getting this lovely E notation. I hate E notation. It always, it's just because it confuses me, because I'm dumb. Like it's just conceptually hard for me to, to understand the E notation, so I, I shy away from it. But all right, finally we got a, too big of a number. So great, we can we can eventually break this. I'm gonna comment this one out um, and we'll just put a little note. This is too big. Um, so there are limits to what we can store for sure. So just be careful, uh, be aware, but you should be okay. Um, tons of digits, yep. The, the book gives us some nice little formatting hints, which is super helpful here. So if you don't like how certain values come out. So if we were to say like print, what is it? Uh, is it one divided by 11, I wanna say? Is that, the, is that the one that comes out really funny? Yeah, here we go. 09, 09, 09, 09, 09, 09, 09, 09, rounded. Right, oops, they rounded. But if I don't want all those digits, right, what we can do is use this really cool formatting syntax. And it's gonna look ridiculous, but all you need to know is that you can go look up the formatting syntax. I don't expect anybody to memorize this formatting syntax because it's not worth it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this in strings here, um, actually, sorry, over here. So we make a string and what you can do is you can say, hey, start formatting. So the colon is like the start formatting operator and then point for the decimal place. Four, I'm sorry, four, meaning I want four decimal places F, it's a floating point number. I, someone came up with it, great, they're, I'm sure they're a lot smarter than I am and it works. Um, and then you say dot format. So you, you give it a string, which is essentially a template. And then you say, what I wanna do is I'm gonna call format and stick this value in to the curly braces. Oops, there it is, I, I kinda dragged it there. So whatever we call dot format on, and again, we'll practice this much more, format is super helpful and useful. Um, and actually there's a newer syntax now, I don't, recall seeing in the book here uh, that we'll talk to talk about as well. It takes this as the formatting template and tries to plug the number in according to this syntax. 
Right, and now we get four decimal places. Look at that. Pretty cool. So, um, so you call that a format string uh, using a template or something. Um, the definition of how you format it here is, is what we stick in here. And uh, just know you can do it and we can go look it up and we can try things when we need to. So the book will have you do a couple exercises with formatting because um, that's pretty cool. Um, arithmetic, right? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponent or to the power of operator is cool. Um, there is another operator as well called modulus. Um, I don't think we talked about this one last week. So what modulus lets me do, um, if you remember back to like third grade math class when you guys did division problems, so like print, let's say 15 divided divided by 4 is, and then what I'm going to do is I want 15 divided by 4. Right, and let's see what we get. All right, 3.75. Sure, we can understand that, but when you tell that to a third grader, they're going to get confused. So what we want is we want that result as an integer. So I'm going to say, hey, I want an int of 15 divided by 4. Oh, I, maybe I have my parentheses on the wrong side. I can never remember. So 15 divided by 4 as an integer value. Right? That means we're going to drop the decimal place. So if we if you take a floating point number, you turn it into an integer, you lose the decimals. And, and it's just a truncation. It's not a rounding. It's a decimal point just gets cut off. Gone. So 3. Okay, we're starting to make sense here, but now we need the remainder. Right? So 3, remainder, remainder. And to get the integer remainder, you use the modulus operator, which is the percent sign. So 15 modulus 4 will give me the whole value. Oh, I should need spaces here, sorry. It's upset with my syntax. I, I try and make it happy. Why does it not like that now? Oh, remove redundant parentheses. Okay. There we go. So the integer result of the actual division and then the whole number integer remainder. And if we run that, now we get, oh sure, so 15 divided by 4 is 3 remainder 3. Right, think back to your math classes. So you can actually do a lot of really cool stuff with modulus. We'll be playing with this in some of our exercises here uh, where we get the remainder result of something. So just know you can do it. it it'll, it's a little confusing sometimes. Um, you'll probably have a quiz question like asking you what's the remainder here. What do I get when I plug this in? You're welcome to just go plug it into Python and see what you get back out. But you know the idea is like you, you're, you're trying it in your head. If I ask you, hey, what's 15 mod 4? Mod for modulus, 15 mod 4? You, you would think through it and, and try it here. I'm not going to give you giant numbers that you can't figure out. Um, but just that's a really cool um, operator. So, and in terms of order of precedence, it has the same order of precedence as multiplication and division. Now, did I already give you guys the order of precedence rant and about how I, I'm irritated with people online? Hey, Blowfish, thanks for dropping by. So, all right, if I haven't, if I have, shout at me and I'll skip it. But um, for a long time, they had this thing um, like going around on Facebook, you know, only a genius can solve this, yada, yada, yada. And it was, uh, what was it? Three divided by, oh, I'm sorry, no, it's like nine divided by three times two or something stupid like that. I forget exactly what uh, what the math problem was. It's not that important. And people would just go nuts and argue that the order of operations is, right, this please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, right, PEMDAS. Right, do you guys remember PEMDAS? Anybody? Maybe? Do they not teach that anymore? Right, that's parentheses, I can't spell it all, sorry. Uh, exponents, multiplication, multiplication, division, addition, right, add, subtract. I'm not going to finish because it's going to run off the line. Okay, they do teach it, good, I'm so glad. Uh, this one has a spelling thing for me. 
Where do I where do I get it? There we go. Typo or parentheses. Change to parentheses instead of sys. That makes more sense. Sure. Parentheses. So your order of operations: parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. And people would say multiplication comes before division, so this must be nine divided by six. And that made the rest of us in the world cry because, as all of you intelligent folks know who have gotten through at least into Calc 1, right, if I remember correctly, um, multiplication and division have the same order of precedence. Just because you say one before the other doesn't mean they're any different, right? They have the same order of precedence, same with addition and subtraction, right? So in our case, we're going to add in modulus as well because it's really just division. Sorry, that is getting long there. Let me, I can probably shrink it just a little bit. And you guys can still see it okay? There. Let me know if that's too small. So because they have the same order of precedence, we operate from left to right. So we get 9 divided by 3 times 2. Right? That's a much different result than the other thing. So if we actually plug this in, and I say 9 divided by 3 times 2, right, Python will do the right thing, and we'll get 6. Right? 6. Perfect. Right? It's not 9 divided by 6. All right, this this was took way more time than it needed to, but I, um, some people just go nuts over this, and, and they don't understand why, because we say it first, it doesn't come first. Right? They, they're, they're group, it's a grouping. Multiplication, division modules have the same order, so we operate left to right. Okay? So be the genius on Facebook, solve that stupid problem, um, but do be kind. Um, some people just might not have learned it properly in school. Um, math seems to be the, the weird thing for some people. They just um, they, they get convinced that they can't learn it, and then they've just uh, got it in their head that they can't, and it, it's sad. But that's okay. Uh, we, we'll, we'll help convince them that everyone can learn math. Um, all right, great. Expressions, evaluating, all that good stuff. Yep, that one's good. Let's see... Yep, um, Python expressions, we can add stuff, yep. Um, yeah, the compound operators or combined assignment operators, we've talked about those. And you can do those with addition, multiplication, subtraction, modulus, right? They all, you know, um, some value is 9, some value minus equals something, right? Some value times equals to uh, so I don't know, some value divided equals by one, I mean divided by one silly, but whatever, and some value modulus equals 10, right? And we can print some value. So 9 minus 3 is 6, times 2 is 12, divided by 1 should still be 12. 12 mod 10, we divide out all the 10s, our remainder left is 2. Let's give it a shot, see if I can do my math in my head. Sometimes it fails. But yes, look at that, 2. So again, just a combined assignment operator. Print hue. Hue. All right, I, I'll bite. I'll bite. Let's see. Hue times int of hue 36. Int of hue 36. Got to try it. <laughs> there we go. I don't know why you had the int in here. Why not just times 36? So you can multiply strings. Multiplying strings is funny. Um, right? Oh, I guess... Uh, I don't know. I've never seen the int version of it before. So Python lets you do some awkward things, right? Like multiplying strings. A string times something just repeats the string that many times which can actually come in super handy late uh, other other cases where we want a certain number of things. Uh, we, we, and we'll get into that later, but Blowfish is just having fun with us. Is that is that laughter? Is that what hoo 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 is? I didn't even tell my dad joke. Man, I, I keep forgetting. I'm, I usually try and tell one every class just to, to lighten the mood. And when we were in person, it used to be extra satisfying when people would groan because the jokes were so terrible. Uh, that's just the, the kind of joke I like. So we've been we've been having trouble in the neighborhood lately with uh, petty larceny, people coming in and taking things and, and whatnot. So we got the ring alarm system 
at my house and it's got those cool cameras that turn on they'll record videos and stuff and you see all the package thieves and whatnot so it's, it's a big problem in the area um, so we got that but I didn't set up the alarm on the garage I've got a camera facing it so I can see but there's no like alarm that automatically call anybody or wake anybody up um, so I just got a video the other night of someone coming into my garage and I got all worried. It's like, oh no, what is, you know, do they get all my nice tools? I mean, I don't have nice tools, but do they get the stuff out of my garage? And I go in and look around, and the only thing that was missing was my limbo stick. And, I, and I'm just thinking to myself, man, how low can this guy go? All right, I'm waiting for the, the virtual groaning here, but uh, I, I'm fond of that joke. I like that one. I probably stole it from someone else. I think I stole it from Professor Milko. It's hard to tell. All the jokes run together nowadays. Multiply strings. Multiple. Multiply. All right. So cool. Yep. Division modulus. Um, ooh, another fun thing. So this was a little bit annoying here, having to do this integer value. If you know you want an integer result and you don't want to have to remember how to do this. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> uh, if that's the high bar, it's a little sad. They're, they're going to go a little downhill from there. But I'll, I'll try to keep the quality at that level, if, uh, if that's what you're aiming for here. All right, so if you don't like doing this int thing here, and let me just leave a comment, right? So this is int, it's the result and in integer. Python knows that this is somewhat of a common operator. Um, so what you can do instead is you can do divide divide or slash slash stands for integer division I want the integer result because then I don't want to have to remember to type int in parentheses around it right I'll just make my life a little easier so 15 divided by 4 is 3 remainder 3 so again just another shortcut Python is full of shortcuts because the kind of people who write it for us are also developers who are lazy um, modulo modulus I don't know anybody who calls it modulo I've always heard modulus um, but that's that's just me um, cool and then some additional practice some number games they do some fun stuff there in chapter two um, oh yeah text here we go this is a really fun one so remember how when we have a variable it stores some value in memory a uh, long time ago when people were just getting started here we, we needed a way to represent characters in memory and someone who was pretty smart said well we can make a table that says here's a number it stands for this character here's a number it stands for this character that turns out it is the ASCII table ASCII -I table ASCII the ASCII table um, the first well here we got a bunch here already um, say is it 65,000 characters I believe it is or so um, so if you go to your calculator that's what we want calculator let's take a peek and again, in the programmer mode of the calculator, you can do this cool little bit operation where I can flip bits on and off. It's fantastic. So in a single byte of 8 bits, have I shown you guys this calculator before? It's all running together in my head. I apologize. Right, I can flip on or off, on or off, on or off. If a bit is on, you get its value. If it's off, you don't. And they all correspond to the powers of 2, which is really cool. And again, you can learn more about this in other classes. Um, just briefly here. I think this will work where I can actually draw. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay, so this is 2 to the 0. So it's 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, on and on and on and on and on. Right, so in a single byte, right, the largest one is 2 to the 7th. Okay, so if you think back to your math class, 2 to the 7th, 128. Of course you knew that off the top of your head. So the values we can get with a single byte worth of data in numeric values is between 0 and 255 if we add them all up. If everything's on, 255. Um, the, the trick here is the sum of all the previous bits is just one less than the next bit. Right? If we come back to our screen sketch, so 2 to the 0 is 1, 2 to the 2 is 2, 2 to the 3 is 4, and 8, and 16, and 32, and 64, and 128. Right? That's to the 4th, to the 5th, to the 6th to the seventh. Did I do that right? Two to the zero. Oh, two to the one. That's what I did. Two to the one is two. Two to the two, two to the three, two to the four. I should just erase because now I look dumb. Okay. Not two to the two. I got I got confused. Two to the one, 
2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4, 2 to the 5, 2 to the 6, and 2 to the 7th. Right, so each one of those, if you add them all up, right, is the sum of the next one minus one. So if you want to know what the number is, just go to the next bit, hey, 256 minus one, and you have a sum, and you don't have to click them all on. So what someone realized is with just two bytes worth of storage, right, just eight bit, or 16 bits here, right, a byte is eight bits at once. So with two of them, we can get 65,500, 135 different values. Again, one less than this value here is the sum of all the previous ones. So if I turn all those other bits on, right, we'll get that big value. Click, 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 click. Oh, that's really fun. 65,535. So I can store, using just two bytes of information, 65,000 different possible values. Right? And with 65,000 different values, we can store a whole bunch of characters. Um, and, right? There's some really weird ones. I don't even understand some of these, but that's okay. They had like special meaning way back when. What we really care about uh, starts somewhere around 32, the space, and then we get some punctuate. Oh, sorry, that's small. Let's enhance that. Right? You get a space at 32, and then you get an exclamation mark, and then some other symbols, and eventually we get some numbers, and here, big fat A. So 65 is the capital A. Uh, this other value here is the hexadecimal value. Don't worry about that. Um, you can learn more about hex later. So 65 is capital A. So if I were to store a single character of, um, so let's say this is capital A is the capital A, right? What it's actually gonna be storing there is the numeric value 65. And Python is just gonna convert behind the scenes for us. So if we wanted, we can print, uh, there's a function called ORD. So ORD is the ordinal value and that's our Unicode value essentially here of capital A. And I, that might actually fail. Let's give that a shot. I think I need one more thing first. Yep, no, no, there we, it worked. So 65, ordinal value, 65, perfect. And then the other thing you can do is you can say, hey, I want the character of a given number. So let's say, uh, let's do 65 plus 469, I think. And then a char of plus nine, uh, 74. Oh no, that's the wrong one. That's, that's the wrong letter. I am clueless as to how to spell my own name here. You know, let me just go look it up. That's probably easier, right? So E 69 R is 82. Thank you. 82 I is 70, oh, 73, I counted wrong, oops, 73. And then C is uh, 65 plus three should be 68, right? So I can print, taking numbers, turn them back into characters, and I get, oh man, 67. That's right, because 65 is the first, I don't add three. Uh, there we go, now I get Eric out of my numeric Unicode values. Yeah, the mechanical typewriters, line break tab, those are, I mean, but we're storing them in a computer. I don't know why, it, okay. It still confuses me, but that's okay. So we can get the numeric value of every letter and convert them back. Um, and there's some limit to how high this is gonna go. I forget what it is. For our purposes, we're not gonna do a whole lot with it, but it is kind of cool. Um, and the other thing worth noting is if I wanted to print um, the something with like multiple lines, I want this on multiple lines, um, yeesh, multiple, 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 I can't, sorry, need more coffee. Um, the way we would have done it is just do another print and like put the other half of it over here. Now, if you really want, you can put in your own new line character, uh, and to do that, it's a backslash n. And notice it changes from green to the lovely orange here to let me know, hey, it's something new. So a backslash is a really uncommon character thankfully. So what Python does is we use this as what we'll call an escape character and say, hey, Python, if you see a backslash, the next thing that comes after it, treat special. Do something special with it. So backslash n is for new line, backslash t is for tab, and this is actually how we can get the quotes in here. Right? I think I mentioned you can do a backslash quote, right? Backslash quote. If you want quote multiple lines and you want to be all nerdy and do air quotes, we can do that with Python code. Because otherwise, if we just had a quote here, it's going to be really confused. 
and it's going to say, oh, well, here's your string. What's all this stuff? It doesn't look like a string to me. Um, so you can escape them. The other option you have, which is much easier, and what I prefer, um, is doing the same thing. Just change what um, quote mark you use around your string. So if you have a string with single quotes here, and you use double quotes inside, you're perfectly fine. Right? And you don't need to do that escaping. You only need to do it if you want the matching character. So what this means now is I can't use apostrophes inside of my sentences. Right? So if we're going to say, hey, that's my joke. Right? If I did that in single apostrophe quotes, Python gets confused. So again, I would recommend just change to double quotes. Or full quotes and not apostrophes, however you want to say that. Or you could, if you liked it, right, if you really wanted to stick with your apostrophes or single quotes, whatever you want to call that character, just escape it. Put a backslash and say, oh, wait, here, here's a special character. Treat it differently. I don't actually want you to end the string. We'll just go with this. Right, we get the same output each time, but just we're just handling it differently here. So you can do some cool stuff. Um, and if you want the backslash character itself, because you really want to use a backslash, you just backslash, backslash. Right, you're escaping the backslash. So it knows, oh wait, you really did mean a backslash because you put it in there twice. Um, other fun things you can do, you can use uh, an R character, which is telling it, hey, you want this as a raw string, and it won't escape anything. So a raw string will just, boom, here, it'll, it'll print that out initially. Uh, so they can be helpful places, uh, but it gets a little confusing sometimes because we're actually going to get that outputted. Um, so I, I don't use raw strings all that often. Um, they, they can be useful, but um, not super, super helpful all the time. All right. So we did pretty good, actually. I think we got through most of Chapter 2. Um, let's see. Just to make sure we're checking out our schedule here. Yeah, so Chapter 2. Um, there are more Zybooks practices and the Xi labs are like bigger labs or bigger practices. Um, they can be very frustrating and I'm going to apologize up front for that. Uh, but what you want to do is if you go check out the um, chapter 18 additional material, it'll give you a little bit more information about how you can program in Xi labs. Nope, that was wrong. I'm sorry. Um, it used to have additional. It's just an empty one. That's silly. Um, was that chapter one? I'm not remembering now what it is. I don't remember because it, it's it's extremely particular about white space. Yeah, f strings. Uh, form that's the new syntax. So we looked briefly at this way you can call dot format, which is really cool. You can essentially do the same thing by putting an f in front here. Um, but we we haven't really got to dealing with functions yet, so we'll talk more about that later and how we can plug a lot of stuff in. Um, so an f string is super fantastic. It's like a built-in format formatter, but you don't have to call dot .format. Um, it's not covered in the book, so I didn't want to bring it up just yet while we're still kind of jumping and getting our feet wet. Um, but f strings are fantastic. Cool. So what I'm going to do, right, I've got a bunch of code here. I'm going to come back to the GitHub client, and I'll see, oh, hey, some stuff changed. Now, it doesn't look like anything changed, but what I did is I added a new line character. So there's technically a new line here at the end, and that's why GitHub thinks it's different. Before it said there was no new line. So this is uh, chapter two examples. So I'll commit and push all of this out. And then a couple of you said you were having some trouble getting your Python code to run. So um, why don't we end lecture a couple minutes early. Um, find me on Discord and you can either send me a screenshot or we can set up a quick little screen share there in like the office hours channel or something. And I can hang out after class and make sure we get you up and running so you can write your own code. Um, you can do it all inside of Zybooks as well. Um, it's got that window to code in Chapter 18. It's not great. There's other online editors as well, but um, it'll be easier if you can use PyCharm, and then we're definitely going to take advantage of some of these debug features later um, that I'll show you more about when we get into it. So sort of easing our way into it here. Um, I think we covered as much as we need to. Again, we'll have more time for practice. The plans to, to meet for lab, uh, 2 to 3.45 on Monday. If you are coming in person, um, they will not let you in the building more than an hour early, and they are somehow going to make sure we're out of the building within 15 minutes of the lab ending. Um, in our case, there's labs. 
Is it before and after? Um, definitely after ours. I don't know if there's a lab beforehand. I'd have to double check. Um, but they, they are being cautious about making sure we have the right numbers of people in the building at a time. So all of your names should be on the list. You're going to have to check in, and they're going to check your name off the list because some of our other classes that are using the labs are too large, and they had to split up who gets to show up for lab at different times. Um, so if you registered you know, in the last, or, you know, the week of classes maybe, or the couple days before class started, you might not be on that list. They'll have a table there that you can go and talk to them and tell them, yes, you're coming. And we should be fine, because I know at least one person said they're not coming. Um, possibly two are not coming to lab times for personal reasons. Um, so we should be perfectly fine. We can fit the right number of people in there, and we'll be okay. Um, so if they do have questions, let me know. You've got my cell phone number. Um, call me or have them call me um, if there's any concerns, and I'd be happy to do what I can to, to get that figured out. But I'll be there um, just a little bit before 2 on Monday, and we can go from there. Um, so I'll post your Chapter 2 quiz um, later tonight. Um, you'll have another week or so to finish that one. Um, shouldn't be too big of a deal, similar to the first quiz. Um, and then we'll kind of do that. So I'll do the readings. I'll post the quiz. Again, the quiz, a lot of it comes from what I've talked about because I'm trying to highlight the important things. Um, but there are going to be questions that come out of the textbook that I might not have ever talked about. And so it's all fair game from the text. So do yourself a favor and do the reading um, and try and keep up with it. It's not too much. If you don't get all the Xylabs done immediately, that's, that's okay. Those can hang for a little while. Um, but they do pile up. I had someone who skipped all of the Xylabs until the week of the final project. And then they were really frustrated. And I said, well, at that point, just skip it because your final project is worth 25% of your grade. Getting Xybooks done is only worth 10%. So like, don't paint yourself into a wall like that where you're going to get stuck. And, and ideally, it's worth doing the practice. Right? It's not busy work, I promise. The, the only way to get good at coding is to code. Right? That, that's really the only way. You can't just read about code and get good at it. It doesn't work like that. You can't listen to me code and get good at it. You have to code yourself. So you're going to get lots of opportunities to practice. You'll have the Thigh books practice, you'll have our weekly lab practice, and then you'll have the project practice, and you'll have a final project practice as well. In the midterm, you'll write some code as well. Um, that'll have some other questions in there too, because it's um, I, I'm not fond of putting people in front of a seat and saying, write this code in this amount of time. Because that, that sort of high-pressure situation is just sad. So you'll have like some small little bits of code to write. Like write a one or two-liner here. Not, you know, a 50-line program or anything like that. So uh, don't worry about it too much. And then next week we'll start on our first project after we've talked about types. And then we'll probably have a project every other week. So you'll get two weeks to do the first project, two weeks to do the next project, um, and on and on and on. So it should all work out pretty well with the schedule. Um, again... Sorry about Tuesday. Um, I, I hope things go well with Geo and the administration and uh, we can get this thing resolved. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see, I guess. So if you don't have any other questions, um, I'll drop off here and I'll come over to um, Discord and I can answer your questions. I know I think two people were having trouble, they, they said, with getting code to run. Um, we can go from there. So while we wait, um, or, so you want me to send you off somewhere on Twitch to go pester some other people. That's, that's one of the fun things here. I like with uh, with Twitch, we can just go send everyone to another channel for a raid. Um, let's see, who's around? Oh, you want to go check out Prof Melko? I think he's he's back. So he teaches chemistry out in Florida. I don't remember if we raided him or not, but he's, he's a real nice guy and really got me started here on Twitch um, and helps me, give me some inspiration to be a little bit better at this. And um, I'd love to take a little bit of time and, and adopt some of his ideas. I mean, Imitation is the, the sincerest form of flattery, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's go check out Prof Melko's channel. Tell him, tell him Eric said hi, and uh, we'll go from there. So if you do have questions, again, find me in Discord. I'll be hanging out after class. We got a while. Um, oh, did he just finish? Uh-oh. That's all right. We can still go anyway. See you guys later. Brief plug for the channel. Brief plug.